Revelation chapter 16, we're going to start with verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they were spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven on the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since man was on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone had the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. These are the final judgments of a righteous, angry God on an apostate, godless world. The first four bowls of wrath were seen last week. The cankerous sore, the corrupted sea, the contaminated streams, the consuming sun. All of these were the first bowls of wrath poured out by God. I call this series Wrath and Rage. Wrath is the fact that God is pouring upon the earth His judgments. The church is gone. It's not even on the scene. And God pours upon the, this world the wrath of His judgment. I call it the wrath and rage is because instead of repentance, the people rage. Instead of people coming to God in repentance, they come to God in rage and curse His name rather than find Him as Savior and Lord. Tonight we're going to look at the final three bowls of judgment which basically go to the conclusion of the tribulation period. Bowl number five is a frightful agony. It's a very interesting, this isn't the first time this has come upon the face of the earth. Bowl number six is the frantic armies, and bowl number seven is a final anger. Look at the madness of the tribulation in verses 10 through 21. 10 and 11, we see bowl number 5, a frightful agony. It's a personal attack in verse 10. Why is it personal? We see, first of all, it goes to their place of power. And then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. All of a sudden, God says, I'm going to have that bowl poured out, and it's going to start right at the source of the power of hatred, the source of power of sin right there to the throne of the beast, to the very throne of the Antichrist. It is a literal darkness, much like that found in the, in the land of Egypt during the time of the plagues. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23, when the darkness was so thick, you could feel it. Now with this darkness comes an agony. The Bible says in verse 10, that this darkness came, and because of the darkness, men gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, I've been in pain several times. I've had some crazy things happen. 
car wrecks, things going on. I've had my knee dislocated. I've had things happen. You wonder how in the world, you know, you can going to handle this pain. But I have never gnawed my tongue. But this is a picture of hell on earth. The Bible says in hell they'll gnaw their tongue, they'll gnash their teeth. And what we see here is a personal play, attack to the place of power. It's also to their place of punishment. The Bible says it's going to be like hell. This is where they're going. This is a, a precursor of what hell is going to be like for these people. Again, they're going to feel a little hell on earth. Can you imagine the tragedy of that? Many of the world will fall in agony in this darkness. Now in the Egypt, the, uh, the children of Israel did not have the darkness. It doesn't mention this here, but perhaps the believers won't have the darkness. This is something that's going to settle down. It's not like it comes in a wave, but it may be pockets of darkness. And we see the people there will have a personal understanding of what hell is going to be like. They'll gnaw their tongues in pain. Verse 11, we see a personal abandonment. The Bible says, and they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. They had that cankerous sore. Remember when the, the, the mark, where the mark is at, that's where that sore will appear? They'll, they'll blaspheme God, the Bible says. They'll hate God. They'll shake their fists at God. We see a tormented rejection. Physical torment affects the heart. Did you know that? You know, people in the hospital are not the same like everybody, you know, like they are normally. They're a different person in the hospital. Why? Most of them are in pain. And when you're in pain, you're not yourself. These people, they turn on God. They are so tormented. The Bible says that in verse 11 that they blaspheme God because of their pain. And then also a troublesome rejection. They reject God too. The Bible says they, they blaspheme Him. They reject Him. We won't have anything to do with you, God. We see physical pain affects spiritual decisions too. Still, they will not repent. You know, I've known people all my life because of something happening to a family member, perhaps a death of a child or a death of a family member, or something happened, they hate God. They're angry at God. They're mad at God. They turn against God. I believe, uh, a lot of people disagree with me, but I believe that because uh, Darwin's daughter died early, he turned from God. He was in a seminary training and turned from God and went to atheism because of his daughter's death. People will abandon God in their pain and suffering. Verses 12 through 6, we see bowl number 6. We see this frightful agony, which is the darkness. Now we're going to see frantic armies in verses 12 through 16. The Bible says the angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. We see a dry river in verse 12. The pouring out of the Euphrates, the angel pours his bowl upon the Euphrates and it just dries up. Do you know they can do that today? They have the Aswan Dam, not the Aswan Dam. There is a dam in Turkey that they can, they can put it up and it'll dry the Euphrates River right up. The Aswan Dam is down in Egypt. But the one in, the, in Turkey, they can dry up that river. That's very interesting. I don't know if this is going to be a way for the angel when he pours out his, his bowl that somebody just turns off the dam and it just shuts everything up and the water just goes just goes dry and it gives away for this army coming across from the east, the kings of the east. There are several locations during the tribulation period. They're the kings of the south. That's many people believe is Africa. Many people believe it might be Saudi Arabia and all those areas. And there's the kings of the north. After the battle of Gog and Magog, the kings of the north are, are different places like Europe. Over in there, in that area where the Antichrist is going to come out of. And then there's the kings of the east. Now they're going to come, the Bible says here in verse, <clears throat> in verse 11 and 12, excuse me. 
They're going to come, and they're going to come across the Euphrates heading for Israel. They're going to try to battle the Antichrist. This, again, is another sign for believers to know the return of Christ is near. If a person is here during the tribulation period and they hear that the river Euphrates has dried up, they better run as fast as they can to Petra. And then we see a preparation of the east. The Bible says, for the kings of the east might be prepared. We can hear now the, saddle, the ra uh, saber rattling of the 200 million man army. Revelation 9.16 says, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. The Bible says there's going to be a great army. Many people attribute this to the army of the east. You know, China has said all along that they can muster a 200 million man army. That's the largest nation in the world next to, to India. It's unbelievable. They'll, they might bring India. They might bring Japan. They might bring North Korea. They might bring all these different Eastern Asian countries, and they'll be all going, the Bible said, towards Israel. In verse 13 and 14, we see a demonic ruse. A demonic ruse. And in verse 13, the Bible says, And I saw three unclean spirits. And frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And these are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day, uh, the great day of God Almighty. We see in verse 13 a demonic trio. It's an obvious move of the satanic trinity. All of these, each one of these guys, a, a, crawl, a frog crawls out of their mouth. Now, folks, I want you to understand there are some people who believe in demonic possession, your pastor is being one. And, and these three men, the Antichrist, the dragon, of course, the Satan, and the beast, or the, the, uh, um, the last person is the, uh, the mouth of the beast, the mouth of the false prophet. These people are demon-possessed. And these three frogs, as we see, are, in verse 14, they're spirits of demons. And we see that these demons come out and they go to, to the great men, the great kings of the earth. And they move their hearts and the kings of the east will begin to move. And the kings of the north will begin to move. And the kings of the south will begin to move. And suddenly we see everyone coming to the crossroads of Armageddon. Verse 14, we see the demonic trickery. There's false signs of demonic miracles. These are the ones who did Great signs, performing signs, which go out all the kingdom. We're going to show you, we have the power. We have the authority. You come, and we'll have a great battle. Matthew 24, 24 says, False Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, even the Jewish people. In verse 15 and 16, we see a dramatic reaction. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. We see a godly warning. Jesus warns those yet without the mark of the Antichrist. I'm going to come for those. I'm going to come, and to them it'll be like a thief. But he says, I want you to watch, and I want you to keep your garments. Now, folks, we already have our garments in heaven. He's not warning us. They can't take our garments from us. Jesus gave them to him heaven. They're going to be our garments. But he's saying to the people down here, look, you better be careful. I'm coming soon. And to the world, I'm going to be like a thief, he says here. But he says, watch your garments, lest you walk naked and see his shame. What he's saying is, you don't take this mark. I'm coming soon. Keep yourself pure. I'm coming soon. We see a godly warning. Look at verse 16. And they gathered them together. Who are them? That's all the armies of the world to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. In the Hebrew, it's Armageddon. Armageddon, the mountain of Megiddo. Okay? So we see here in verse 16 a godless warfare. God is gathering the godless to the battle of Armageddon. 
The kings of the east are coming. The kings of the south are coming. The kings of the north are already there. They've already attacked Jerusalem. They've already killed two-thirds, as we'll see later, of the Jewish people. And they're already there occupied, the kings of the north. Now the kings of the, the east will come and the kings of the south. Why? I'll give you one little three-letter word. Oil. That's where all the oil's at. And they're thinking the kings of the north have made their move and they're going to control everything, so we better stop it. Verses 17 through 21, we see the final bowl, the bowl number seven, a final anger. The finality is announced in verse 17. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. We see in verse 17 a loud voice of condemnation. Did you note that in, when Christ was on the cross in John chapter 19 and verse 30, he said, it is finished? You see, that was spoken by Christ concerning our salvation. It is finished, meaning salvation has been purchased. Salvation has been completed. Now here in Revelation 16, 17, he says it is done. That was spoken concerning judgment. The judgment is done. And now all we've got, we got to wait for is the fat lady singing. What we see here in verse 17 is a loud voice of condemnation and a loud voice of completion. The completion of Christ's will is done. The world has come to total agony agonizing hatred of God. They're in pain. They're in suffering. All the three great armies come together. But they don't realize. They don't know. Here comes Jesus. He's coming. Verse 18 through 20, the finality is activated. In verse 18, look at the commencement of God's final judgment. In verse 18, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. This is a powerful earthquake. There's never been one like this. A little later, we're going to find out the full effects of it. Again, you've never lived till you've lived through an earthquake. I don't mean just a little tremble. I mean one that just sits there and shakes for a while. It's pretty spooky. The most, the, the most stable thing in your life is the earth, and it's moving. Very interesting. In verse 18, we see the sights, the sounds, and the shakings. Verse 18, it says there are noises, the sounds, the thunders and lightning, the sights, and there is a great earthquake, the shakings. We see the conditions of God's final judgment has come in verse 19 and 20. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell. And a great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wrath, cup of the wine, the fierceness of his wrath. We see in Mark 13, 19, for in those days there will be tribulation such as never been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. Nothing like this ever before. No battle ever before. Nothing has ever been like this. God is coming. In verse 20, the Bible says very, very simply, then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Folks, that's a pretty powerful earthquake. That's shaking the earth. Mountains will crumble. Islands will just vanish. There'll be great waters. There'll be great tsunamis. There'll be great earthquakes. All of this is going to happen. We're going to see the moment of triumph here in a moment. We're going to look at different, different uh, uh, portions of Scripture. I want you to, to turn there as best you can. We're going to talk about a moment of destitution here. First of all, most of the Jewish people by this time will have died. Two-thirds of them. Four, if it happened today, 4.6 million Jewish people will die by this time. Turn to Zechariah, the 13th chapter. Now, Zechariah is right next to Malachi. 
Matthew, you go back one, that's Malachi in the Old Testament, and you got Zechariah. We'll be in Zechariah for a while, but in Zechariah 13, 8. Zechariah 13, 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. Two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die. The Antichrist is going to come into the land. He's going to present them a, a housewarming gift. They're going, to, they're going to dedicate the temple. We've got the temple to dedicate. And the Antichrist, surely you're going to invite me. Sure, we'll invite you, but you know you can't come in, but we'll let you come off and see it. So he goes, he says, oh, by the way, I got your housewarming gift and I'm putting it in the temple. It's a statue of me. And that's when the Jews say, no, no, you're not God. We're not going to, we're not going to worship you. And that's when he'll have his army already there waiting and he'll turn on them. And two thirds of the Jewish people will die. The north part of the land. When they attack Jerusalem, they always attack from the north. So they're going to come down and, the, and they're going to attack all that area up in, in, Jude, uh, up in uh, uh, Galilee area will all the Jews will die. Samaria area, the Jews will die. Judea, the Bible says they will flee. So the southern, that's how I know it's going to be up in the north they're coming from because the southern Jews will be able to escape into Petra. By the mark, they will die. Some of them will associate with the Antichrist. Some of the Jewish people will accept the mark and they will be doomed to die. By their martyrdom, the affliction of the Antichrist, they will refuse the Antichrist and his mark, and the Antichrist will kill them. And by their massacre, there in the city of Jerusalem, the antagonism of the Antichrist's war, the battle of Jerusalem be fought. Folks, have you noticed in the, in the news how everyone is so concerned about Jerusalem? How everyone's talking about it's got to be an international city. Even the Pope has weighed in. You know, we've got to make it an international city. The United Nations has got to be an international city. This can't be the capital of Israel. We've got to make this an international city. Well, it won't be an international city. It'll be an Antichrist city. It'll be his capital then. So how is that going to happen? Zechariah, the 14th chapter, and verse 2. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. This is not Armageddon. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled. And the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. What it means is they're going to escape and eventually return. So that third of the Jewish people. Half of them will be from Jerusalem. But a third of the Jewish people will escape and they will depart. They'll escape to the rocks. A third of the Jewish people, that's 2.3. If it were today, 2.3 million people will escape to Petra. It's like the exodus in reverse. And they'll go to Petra. Revelation 12, verse, stay in Zechariah. Revelation 12, verse 13 and 14. Now when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That's Israel. The male child is Jesus. Verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time. That's one. Times. That's two. That's three. And half a times, that's three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. That's how we know that the Antichrist is going to attack Jerusalem in the middle of the tribulation period. They will escape to the rocks and they will entreat the Redeemer. Back in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. I will bring the one-third. That's that one-third the Bible says in Revelation is going to get out. And I will bring the one-third to the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Here it comes. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Do you remember when Jesus was there in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the last week, what they call the Passion Week? 
that he cried to Jerusalem and said, oh, oh, I would, if I could, I would gather you into myself like a hen does her chicks. But he says, I will not come until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, folks, listen. That's exactly what the Jews in Petra will say. The Antichrist will send a portion of his army down there to Petra to try to fight them. God will stop them. But they'll be waiting for them there and they'll see this great army waiting to destroy them and they'll say, who do we turn to? And they'll say, what about Jesus? And they'll call on his name and they will be his people, the Bible says. Romans 11, 26 and 27 says, and so all Israel, the remnant, all Israel, all 2.3 2. Uh, million, all Israel will be saved as is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The Jews will be saved. We're going to see now a moment of destruction. I want you to go keep your finger here in Zechariah. Briefly, I want you to go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, and we're going to read through four verses. So I want you to bear with me there. That's why I want you to turn there. This is the Messiah's rescue in the Old Testament. Most of the time we see right now this portion of Scripture you're going to read tonight is going to look like Revelation 19 when Jesus comes out on his white horse. Verse 1, who is this who comes from Edom? Edom was the east land of there where Petra is at. With dyed garments from Bo Bozrah. Now Bozrah was the capital of Edom, right near Petra. The one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I will speak in righteousness mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from people no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Again, this is just like the Jesus coming out of heaven in Revelation 19. In verse 1, we see the Messiah's rescue. In verses 2 through 4, we see the Messiah's revenge. The Antichrist doesn't know what hits him. Now let's go to Zechariah 14. We see the Messiah's revenge. The Messiah's revenge. In verses 3 through 5, Zechariah 14, 3 through 5, we see the Messiah's presence. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making it a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north and half of it will toward the south. And then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That's when Jesus is going to go from Petra to Jerusalem. And he's going to attack Jerusalem. And he's going to kill the Antichrist. And he's going to rescue those people who were held captive. Next, we see the Messiah's power in Zechariah 14, verses 12 through 14. We see how he's going to accomplish this. Verse 12 says, And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Not a pretty picture, is it? Verse 13, it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them and everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, and apparel in a great abundance. Folks, Jesus is going to go to battle there in Petra. 
He goes to battle there in Jerusalem and eventually there up in Armageddon. He destroys the Antichrist. He destroys the false prophet. And he will capture Satan and throw him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Jesus will establish his kingdom through the judgment of the sheep and goats as found in Matthew 25. And Christ will reign on the earth for a thousand years. Now how should we respond to this? I want you to turn your Bibles back to Revelation. And I want you to go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Now we have flown. I do mean flown through the prophecy. This is the latter part of the last part of the second half of the tribulation period. Jesus is going to come back. We're going to rule and reign with him. Satan will have but a season. He only has seven years upon this earth. The Antichrist will only have seven years. The false prophet will only have seven years. But Jesus is going to come back and we're going to rule and reign with him. Those who have been judged as goats will go to hell. Those who have survived the great battles of war and have been judged as sheep will go in to populate the kingdom. Well, we know for sure we got two and a half million human beings who are Jewish from Petra that will come and populate the kingdom. We don't know how many others will be there. What other Gentiles, perhaps somewhere in the world, in Europe or in Asia or Africa, that will come and be judged and be found available to go into the kingdom. Verse 17, how should we deal with this? Revelation twenty-two seventeen, 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The first thing we must note, we can't delay. Don't delay. Be saved. Our friends need to be saved. Our family members need to be saved. Our next door neighbors need to be saved. Don't delay, the Bible says. Look at verse 18 and 19. Don't depart. Verse 18 says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's a pretty sobering thought. The Bible says don't mess with Revelation. There are some people who believe that because Revelation is the end of the Bible, you don't mess with the Bible. You don't mess around. There are folks, there have been people who've laughed at the Bible. There are people who've, who've ridiculed the Bible. They've made fun of the Bible. They've not believed the Bible. They've tried to change the Bible. They do everything they can. All these lost gospels that have been found in the last 10 years. Can you imagine what God is thinking up there in heaven? He says, you're adding to it. You're adding to my word. I've told you, I warned you not to add to the word. And beloved, let me tell you, God is very jealous about His Word. His Word is holy. It is the living Word. It is the Word that Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word shall not pass away. What does that mean? That means you and I will be studying the Bible throughout all eternity. I don't know if we're going to have a one-book library, but who cares, right? It's the best one to have. Finally, we don't delay in verse 17. We don't depart in verse 18 and 19. And finally, in verse 20, we don't disregard. Verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Don't disregard it. Jesus is coming soon. Folks, I believe with all my heart the things we're seeing around us, the sounds that we're hearing, we, we are in the presence. We are living among the tribulation generation. 
And I say, Jesus is coming quickly and we can answer like John, even so come, Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. We ought to get ready. Now, folks, I don't mean that we sell everything we have, buy some white robes and get on top of our roofs and wait. I think those, there's one word for a person like that, idiot. No, we've got life to live. We've got things to do. We've got people that need to come. We have people that need to receive the Lord. Folks, listen, we have to do what we can between now and then. Daughters, sons, cousins, aunts and uncles, moms and dads, children are going to die. Go to hell. Go through this horrible time of tribulation. Oh, I am glad that Jesus did not come before I got saved. And I'm glad that Jesus did not come before my children were saved. And folks, I'm glad Jesus didn't come before you were saved. And we need to be busy, don't we? We need to prepare. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let